you know, you asked how we come up with um, the various design. Cook Look is only the first of four. We talked to a lot of people. You know, we talked to directors of photography. We talked to assistants, focus pullers. And we talked to our main customers. And the main buyer of stuff is not the user, the DP. It's, it's a rental house. Makes sense. So we talked to all those people. And, and what's interesting is the director of photography is actually the easiest guy to get the input from. We know what he wants. If he's a cook guy, he wants the cook look, um, a, nice, a nice lens that has the cook look at the speed, whatever speed he needs it at. So that's, that's actually pretty easy. The assistant, though, is the guy that actually handles the lens, takes it in and out of the box, puts it on the camera, has to full focus. And they actually had probably the greatest input to the lenses that, from the S4s forward. They wanted to lens, up until the S4s, lenses were primarily what's called multi-thread, and which means they're basically they're just two threads, one on top of another. And as you turn it, that, that's how you focus it. The problem with that is, A, you're restricted by diameter because if it's a small little teeny lens, obviously the arc length is very small. So you end up with focus numbers like you might have, you know, two feet, three feet, four feet, infinity. Still lenses. Yeah. So one of the things we did, the assistants wanted, because they, they have to pull focus, is to make that diameter bigger and give them more marks. Also, they want it, if you, again, if you look at the way focus marks works, it's sort of a logarithmic type scale. So the diff distance between the wide, the close marks is really big. And then as you get toward infinity, they get really bunched up. So instead of using a multi-thread, we used a cam. And a cam allows us we went to a bigger diameter, and then we used a cam, which allowed us to squeeze the marks at the at the close focus end and spread out the marks at infinity as you get toward infinity. So a Cook lens has a lot more marks on it than previous lenses. Uh, we did all kinds of things with, you know, if you take a look on the website and take a look at it, you'll see, you know, we have windowed scaling. We've got all kinds of features, and almost all these came from talking to the assistants. We know we nailed it because almost everybody in the industry since the S4s came out have copied the ergonomic design. I was just going to, I was just going to say it's interesting the way Zeiss, Canon, uh, and Sigma have taken still lenses, uh, yeah. rehoused them with much larger diameter. Uh, there are a couple of custom houses, Duclos being a, an example, which will mod uh, still lenses. But I know you're going to tell me with the remaining two that that's not all that you do. That's not all we do. That's correct. So, and then the, and then, so we've got the directors of photographies, we've got the assistants, and the last people we talk to are the rental houses or the, or the actual owners of the lens. And, you know, what's important to anybody that owns a lens is A, that it works all the time and that it's, e and when it's not working, it's easily serviced. Ah. Whether they're your lenses and you just use them for your own use or you're in a rental house, if they're, you know, sooner or later, they need to be clean. They need to be. They need to be serviced. If it takes two or three weeks to service a set of lenses, you're out of luck unless you're on vacation. And that's cash flow that the rental house doesn't have. Absolutely. ROI calculation. A lot of times when you do the, the first design of anything, it's you know the computer term kludge. Yes. Okay. Well, usually the first design of almost anything is a kludge. You know, somebody's working on this part of it, somebody's working on that, and they figure out how to put those pieces together, but it's not elegant. It works, but it's not elegant. And I like, I think a lot of companies, a lot of my competitors stop there. We spent an extra year developing the S4s, and this is when we had no money, but we've spent an extra year to doing that so we can make a really elegant design that is serviceable. On average, you can service a cook lens in about an hour. Most of my competitors who either range anywhere from non-serviceable in the field, you have to go back to the factory, to days to just service one lens. So this is a, this is a big thing. Uh, uh, if you're a rental house and you have it your own technicians, as most of them do, a set of lenses can come in the, you know, the previous evening 
and then go out the next year and be completely cleaned and serviced and ready to go. So that's really important. Um, those are the sort of calculations we put into a, a modern cook design, and it served us really well. You know, we went on from the S4s. Um, we then did a series called the Five Eyes, which, uh, which are T14. The S4s are T2. The Five Eyes are T14. We then did a series called the Mini S4s, which are T28. This is a bit like Leica and Sumacron, Sumolux, Elmerit, like that. Yeah, it is, except we, we make all our own lenses. We don't repackage, uh, we don't have other people making the lenses for us or repackaging other people's lenses and putting our names on it. These are all the Cook design, all designed by the same team that did the S4s, all built in the same factory in England. Now, there, there's one thing that I came across as, as I prepped for our conversation today, and that is the I suffix. Okay. Let me deviate for a moment because I am fascinated by this. As a still photographer, I have EXIF data. Uh, when I'm using uh, Lightroom or anything else, I know exactly what lens I was using, what the aperture was, what camera body I was using, the shutter speed, the EV, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I don't have access to that kind of stuff once I'm looking at footage. And it kills me. It kills me because I really want to understand what lenses I'm using most often, what apertures I'm using most often. Remind me, I want to come back to this story about the arc lights because it resonates for a decision that I'm looking at right now. Uh, but you were apparently at the epicenter. <laughs> Am I overstating the case? No, no. And we're still at the epicenter. Of metadata. When we started the slash I, which stands for intelligence, by the way, and, and just so your, your, your listeners or viewers know, we were using I before Apple. You know, I get a lot of fuck. Why are you doing what Apple did? Good luck trying to steal that mind share back. Before people know they needed it, I don't know that it was clear to me, but it always seemed important to me to add metadata to lenses. Nobody thought it was useful. You know, what is that? Only a few people, a few people that did visual effects would say, oh, pretty cool. That that could be useful. But for the most part, people say, ah, don't need, I don't I don't want it. We kept um, We kept working on it. Um, and what's happened in the last 15, 16 years is people now know that metadata is important and it can be useful. I'm still not sure Just it's a little actually bit. been used in anger yet. You know, we have a lot of people using it. A lot of people talk about it. But because there's no industry standard, it makes it difficult. You know, this piece of equipment doesn't exchange data correctly with that piece of equipment. This, that lens over there doesn't have metadata at all. And if it does, it's a completely different format. So what we've been working with now is in the industry, and hopefully at NAB this year, we hope to make uh, some announcements that uh, the industry is starting to come together and coalesce around a common language, which is I. Uh, if you look at our website, you'll see that we have a lot of I technology partners. We've freely given this system to our competitors, Anjanu, uh, Zeiss, uh, Fujinon, Canon. In the PL world, they all support the eye system. On the camera side, you know, we've got RED, Airy, Panavision, Sony. So I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I'm hoping that an industry standard is evolving. And, one, and once it does, then getting the kind of information you want will be easier. There's something else about that too. I mean, even now on the still photography side, it's not a 100% uh, handshake. I get EXIF data saying the lens is something other than what it is. But I'm fascinated uh, by the prospect of having sufficient metadata to be operable by software for correction purposes. Mm -hmm. Is that part of your thinking? Well, where we're going with that, we, we now have, we are now on the verge of introducing the third generation of the eye system. So the first generation was just basic lens metadata, stop, depth of field, focus, the usual things you wouldn't expect. The second generation, which we started delivering now, is we've included uh, inertial data so that you can actually get a track of the camera through space. Um, now, inertial data over time is really not so good, but 
but frame to frame is relatively accurate, but it does drift. So using the inertia data with a good, good tracking software can give you, when you have an occlusion, when you have a loss of uh, track, you can, you can use the inertia data to rebuild the track. That is absolutely fascinating. Yeah, and we've been working with uh, several companies. The most uh, the most engaged company is called PF Track from the, the Pixel Farm. They make tracking software, and they're they're trying to utilize this technology so that again, when they have an occlusion, it, it's pretty easy for them to re to, to find the track. Let, let me jump in and, and ask this question. We touched on it earlier. I want to come back to it. This notion of computational imaging and the changing balance between uh, trying to achieve optical, let's not use the word perfection, I, I get it, but let's uh, optimal physical design and saying, hey, look, we can make a lens a lot cheaper and access a much wider audience if we don't design to make the best lens we know how to make instead use software and continue on Moore's doubling of computing power every, every 18 months. Do you feel a pressure to succumb to that trend? No. Cool. Uh, I, I mean, will we go there? If that's where the industry wants, of course. I would be... Um, that would be a real um, philosophical change in how we design lenses um, and, and sort of giving up the keys to the kingdom to the software guys. And great. That's a great point. I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I want to be at the helm of Cook when that happens. Uh, that would, but what we are doing in I3 is we will, which we'll be introducing later this year, is we are doing, you know, part of it is this, we'll be introducing in the lenses a, a distortion map of the lens that'll be unique to that lens. We'll measure it at the factory and we'll include that. Unique yeah. instance, that unique instance of the lens. Yes, it, it'll be unique to that serial number lens. It will not be a generic map for all 50 millimeter Cook lenses. It'll be a map for that Cook 50 millimeter lens. So um, I think that'll be a big step for the VFX people along with the inertial data. Um, uh, letting software do my job, uh, that, that's a hard one for me to swallow. Though.